time and played a video for y'all, and we'll recap that video uh, here in just a minute. In fact, uh, I actually thought, you know, I, I hope that whenever you watch that video that you didn't, like, get scared or nervous uh, or worried uh, about it. And I'm waiting on Brother Jonathan back there. Um, and so I thought tonight I would bring another video uh, to you. So I know some of you are like, Josh, we didn't come to watch videos, but I really thought I would show you this video because some of y'all might feel uh, like the person in this video. And so, uh, Jonathan, if you would go ahead and uh, play this video. Uh, it's not near as long as the other one was, so... McDonald's in the drive-thru. No, we can't. Yeah. <laughs> you can't. You can. You can go in the drive-thru, but you can't go in the playground. Yeah, it's just really frustrating. You, the, if you go through the drive-thru, it's just boring because you have to wait for your view to come. And if you're inside playing on the playground, it wouldn't be boring. Yeah. And now they have to shut down. Yeah. And now that everything in this town has to go all the way down. And the kids don't want us to do that. I mean, why would germs come around to people if they don't want germs to come around to them? Because everyone doesn't like germs because they get sick and, and everything has to be shut down for everybody to be safe. Yeah. And it's just not fair because everything that is fun shut down. And the only thing that that is open is nothing. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> nothing. Yeah, and I'm actually maybe church too. We can't go to church. Yeah, and it's just so fun. We're going home church, so that's why we're doing church on the TV, right? Yeah, but but the real church is Hume's Academy and you get to get candy and toys. And if you have a big number you can get two. Wow. Like play doh candy. And once I got that fish kind, and it's just, I only wanted, I only wanted to have fun with Play-Doh, so I bought it, and now, like, everything in this world has to be shut down, and it's not fair. <laughs> All right, you can yeah. stop it. <laughs> uh, how many of y'all have felt like that over the last, like, four months, amen? You're just like, are you kidding me? I just thought she was, it was, it was at McDonald's. And she's like, it's so frustrating. <laughs> and going to McDonald's, there's no plate. That's just boring. <laughs> anyway, that, uh, that video certainly wasn't near as uh, serious as one we watched last week. Um, I would, um, we're going to go back to the book of Exodus and uh, continue our study. But I didn't know if anyone had any thoughts or uh, comments about last week and uh, if you'd thought about it over the week and you had any other um, thoughts after watching that. Did anybody want to comment? I normally do a recap from the last week. Have faith, not fear. Amen. Uh, Brother Bob? Amen. Yeah. Yeah, brace yourself, get prepared, uh, which, um, and, and really, if you study the Scripture, it oftentimes tells us to be firm, to be steady, to be solid. It describes a tree, a post, uh, and so I think that bracing yourself is, a, is an appropriate message. 
And to your point there, it could get worse. Just think about what Roger said whenever we were going through our prayer request, you know, about burning down. The, it feels like they're burning down the country. It better change before we burn it all down. And so, um, hey, again, I want to tell you, I don't, I don't, I wasn't presenting that as truth because uh, truth is God's word. Now, jo- you're going to say, Josh, are you saying that wasn't God's word? I'm saying, I don't. I don't know. I just felt like it was a good conversation for us to have. Um, But, folks, at the end of the day, God is still God. God is still in control. And if the worst thing happens is that he takes my life, then praise be to God, right? I mean, isn't that what Paul said? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, and so so be it. Um, But I... um, I really did feel compelled to show it to you just, just to get your thought or your mind thinking about, folks, bad things could happen. And it really doesn't take somebody really that smart to say, our country is in turmoil, and regardless of what happens in this next election, it's, I'm just thinking either way, no matter what happens, just, I think that there's going to be trouble uh, some way or another. And so... Um, please be joining us for our prayer uh, times up here as a church, um, and, um, and let's just pray through it. Amen? All right, well, let's go back to Exodus. Exodus. We're in Exodus chapter 4. Um, who remembers? I gave you all some homework, but before we get to our homework, uh, what, what was going on in Exodus, the well, last time we, we studied it. Anybody remember? Moses is having a conversation with God at the burning bush. And Moses kept coming up with what? Excuses. And these excuses were why not to do what God was calling him to do. Uh, and as we walked through each one of those and we examined our own life, we, we kind of made, or at least that was, we were painting this picture that a lot of us come up with excuses on why we're not going to do what God has called us to do. Uh, and he could give you very large tasks and you could be like Moses and say, you know, why would they follow me? Uh, he could give you uh, simple tasks and you still try to turn away or not do them. Folks, I, I will tell you that Fighting to stay out of the perfect will of God is not a good place to be. In fact, the place you want to be is right in the center of God's will, and regardless of what it is that He's calling you to do, uh, whether it's huge or whether it's small, stepping out and doing what God has called you to do is exactly where you'll want to be. But, has anyone ever, ever actually done that, stepped out and followed God whenever God leads you to do something? And I know I asked this question uh, the other time too. Did anybody ever done that? We have, some of you? Yes? By doing that, does it make it easy? If you find, when you finally surrender and say, I'm going to follow what God told me to do, does it make everything easy at that point? So, so not necessarily. Uh, in fact, I would tell you, it seems like to me, the, when you step out and you start doing something God has called you to do, you can almost expect that something is going to happen to make you question about what you're doing, why you're doing it, where you're going. It might be a word that somebody says to you uh, or a battle that comes up or a sickness, but all of a sudden, something's going to happen. Uh, it, I've always heard it kind of like this. And, and it's, you're either fighting against Satan or you're running with him. And if you're stepping out and doing things with, for God, guess what? Satan is going to fight against you. And so I don't know about you, but I would much rather fight against him than run with him. Uh, so step out and do that. All right, let's, uh, let's dive into uh, what was going on. I, I want to make sure that we hit our homework that we talked about. All right. 
Hold on, I, uh, there's my notes. Um, now, last, last time we met, we talked about that word harden because it talks about uh, God was going to harden the Pharaoh's heart. And I asked you all, why, why would God harden his heart, or what does that mean? Do you all remember us talking through that? But that word harden, what did it actually or could be translated as? Resolve. Resolve. Uh-huh. Um, it's the picture, and, and I gave you other examples of where that same word was translated differently uh, in a couple of different texts in Joshua, the exact same uh, word and how it was translated. What God is really saying there is he's going to allow Pharaoh to act the normal way that he would act. In other words, he's going to kind of turn him over to act however he would, he would want to or in his normal being. So as we studied this, let's, uh, let's not, um, not forget that. Now, uh, let's read. Oh. By the way, Ruth Ann is not here, and so I sent her a text, and I told her to pick who she wanted to read, and she picked Billy Peavy. <laughs> who would like to read tonight? She really did give some names, but that wasn't, it was, she did, <laughs> so funny, Billy. All right, Jim, Brother Jim. I want us to be able to talk about our um, the homework, but before we do, we got to kind of set it back up because uh, to know what we were talking about. Let's read uh, Exodus chapter four, verses nineteen uh, through twenty-six. Now Actually, the you start in eighteen. Eighteen. Yeah. Okay. So Moses went and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, "Please let me go and return to my brethren." Who are in Egypt and see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. All right, now stop right there. So, who is Jethro? His father in law. That's Moses' father in law. Uh, and uh, Moses has already had this kind of argument or kind of back and forth with God at the burning bush. And this is at the, the end of that. We're seeing he finally says, All right, I'm going to go. Uh, and he goes the first thing right to his father-in-law. Why would he go to his father-in-law and say this? Because it's his employer. That's who he worked for. And so he's out there actually watching his father-in-law's sheep uh, when this takes place. And so, all right, pick up where you were talking there in verse number 19. Now the Lord said to Moses and Midian, Go, return to Egypt, for all the men who sought your life are dead. Then Moses took his wife and his sons and set them on a donkey. And he returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. And the Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in your hand. But I will harden his heart, so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn. And it came to pass on the way at the encampment that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Then Zephora took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at Moses' feet and said, Surely you are a husband of blood to me. So he let him go. Then she said, You are a husband of blood. Because of the circumcision. All right. Um, so last week we were just getting, or two weeks ago, we were just getting in this. And I asked you all this question, and this was your homework. The firstborn son that, if you look um, there in verse number 24, and it came to pass... Well, actually, whenever, whenever God is talking to Moses, and he says, say this to Pharaoh, and he says, Israel is my son, and then he says, I will kill your firstborn son. Who is he talking about there, the firstborn son? Who is the firstborn son? Who is the firstborn son? All 
All right, so Bob's going to say Pharaoh's son. Um, and why would you say it was Pharaoh's son? This is what you say to Pharaoh. So because he said this is what you say to Pharaoh, okay? Does anybody else see anything different? Everybody think that is... Anybody see anything different there? Let's look at this. Verse number, uh, verse number 22. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn son. So the Israelites are what he is saying is his firstborn, that God is saying is my firstborn son. Yes, absolutely. But is he saying that he's going to kill the Israelites? Is that what your question is, Kevin? Yeah, when he when he is yeah he's talking about the children of Israel. He's saying, "Hey, this is my firstborn son." So is he going to ki- is that what he's saying? Is I'm going to kill Pharaoh's son? Is that what he's saying? Is he comparing? He is definitely making a separation between the two for sure. Um, now say that again. Oh, that's that's interesting. I don't. I don't. Uh, I had not thought of that. Um, and so that's a that's a lot different direction than what I was wanting to go. I'd have to think through that first. Uh, Ron? Okay, so Ron says, uh, has to be referring to Pharaoh's son because when you get to the 10th plague, the 10th plague is the killing of the firstborn son and that was the Pharaoh's son. It was all of them in Egypt. And so, all right, James, did you raise your hand? Somebody on that row did. <laughs> I thought somebody raised their hand there. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was really quick. Let me, so, so let's think through this now on verse number 24. And it came to pass on the way at the encampment that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. So who did God seek to kill on the way to the encampment? (laughs) Patty doesn't know. That's what you're supposed to say. (laughs) Leave you out of it, James. I learned during our business meeting. (laughs) Who, who, Who was God going to kill there in verse number 24? Is he going to kill Moses? Who's God going to kill there in verse 24? We got one Moses, one I don't, two I don't knows. So, uh, so uh, certainly up there in verse 22 and 23, you we can. We we've talked about it could be the Pharaoh's son, but when you get to verse 24. Uh, Moses is on his way to encampment. He says uh, that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Who is the him that God gets that he's going to kill? Moses? So, so are we saying that it was Moses that he was going to kill? Now let me ask you this. Why would God call Moses and argue with Moses this whole time and then send him away when he finally starts going? God says, now before you even get there, I'm going to kill you. 
Ah, okay, wait just a minute. Janet, did you hear what Janet said? Could it be Moses' son? So he could have said to Moses, I'm going to kill him, your son. Because he wasn't circumcised. So, so look at so what happens right after this conversation. So verse number 25. Um, uh, Jim, go ahead and read verse number 25. Yes. Okay, so now, now who is Sephora? Moses' wife, the daughter of Jethro. And so this is who he's married to. They come, and all of a sudden, she somehow figures out that someone is about to die. And the reason they're about to die, what's the reason they're about to die? Not get the covenant of circumcision, right? Okay. So, is it that God had Moses and was going to kill Moses because Moses' son wasn't circumcised? Or was it that God grabbed Moses' son and was like, I'm going to kill him because he's not circumcised? Which one is it? Going to stay with Moses. Okay. Uh, by the way, which one would probably hurt Moses more? The son, right? But um, because Moses was already called to deliver the children of Israel. So even if he kills the son... Even if he kills the son, Moses could still accomplish his will. But, but let's just back up a little. Now let's, now let's go back a little bit in what I'm saying here. Back up to verse number 22. Then you shall say to Moses, this says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. Okay? So I say to you, could that you be Moses? So I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. Now, now just follow me. The only way that Moses' son could serve God was if he was circumcised. By him not circumcising his, his son was a not allowing Moses' own son to serve God. So does he say there, let my son go that he may serve me, but if you refuse to let him go... Indeed, I will kill your son, and that your is Moses, your firstborn son. And I'm telling you, Moses. So, so that that was my question about the homework. Was it? Is it possible that God said, hey, say this to, to, to Pharaoh, that if, hey, if you don't let my people go and serve me, I'm going to kill your, I'm going to kill your firstborn son. But he, but he pauses there and says, by the way, Moses, if you don't follow what I have directed, I will kill your firstborn son. And the reason I ask that question is because look at what happens right after that. What happens right after that, the wife says... Oh no, our son's about to die. Let's go grab a stone. Let's circumcise him. And once he did that, everything was fine. Once she did that, everything was fine. Was she trying to save her husband's life or her son's life? Is it going to be on the test? <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. And, here's, and here's, here's why this is important. Because when you step out to do God's will, and that's finally what Moses has done. He's argued back and forth, and he's finally said, I'm going to go do this. Folks, you've got to make sure that you have your own house in order, too. 
You got to make sure that it's all in order because it was it was critically important to God that Moses' son had been circumcised the way that God had set up before he ever let him go start leading the children of Israel. You got to have your own house cleaned up. Bob. You've got to be in that covenant. And that covenant was with circumcision. Um, now, our covenant that protects us is what? The blood of Jesus. And so if you want the protection of God, then you've got to have the blood of Jesus. Now, um, this whole thing about it, was, it, was it Moses' son or was it Pharaoh's son? Folks, I've, I've looked at it many different ways. And it is really, really hard to tell. But know this, that I would say with some things inside God's word, it seems like it might have been both. He was sending a message to both of them. Hey, you need to tell Pharaoh that if he doesn't do this, I'm going to, I'm going to kill his firstborn son. I also think that uh, he was sending them the message to Moses that he had to get his house in order. Why would Moses not have circumcised his son? Why would he not circumcise his son? Why wasn't it already done? James? His wife was a Gentile? What do you think? You're going with James? <laughs> what were you saying, Betty? Okay, because he was raised Egyptian? Got lazy? Yep. Yeah, and and I think there is a lot to this where he was raised at cuz he spent some time with his mother. Um, and understanding what the Hebrews would have done. But after that, he was completely educated, trained, and grew up in Pharaoh's household uh, until he fled out into the wilderness. And so 99% where's Bob? A percent of his life would have been spent outside of the, the Hebrew teachings. He's raised that way. I do like this thought of him being lazy, though. You know, that's a... You used lazy. Didn't y'all hear him say lazy? Complacent. Complacent. That's a, and then that's a, look at what Val said. Why, why did his wife know that it was about circumcision and know that that's what needed to happen? <laughs> Brother Jonathan? Uh, uh, and and the, I think it does come back to the priest of, of Jethro in the teachings probably. But if that's the case, then Moses should have known. Uh, however, he was acting more like a non-Hebrew than he was a Hebrew. Uh, for sure. Um, but she certainly knew and recognized it. It seems like really quickly, you never hear a circumcision talked about in this whole passage until all of a sudden she's got the boy and she's already circumcised him. Yeah. Some, somehow she knew. 
Yeah. Um, and, and whether it was Moses uh, God had hold of or the son, either way, it sent fear through her to say, we got to start following the ways of Yahweh, of God. Um, all right. Anything else on that part? That was your homework assignment. That's why I was asking you to really spend time and look at that because it, it, depending on, in fact, Bob, I'm really glad you pointed that out about what the King James, how it words it because the way that you worded it there, it does kind of say, it's in like, seem like there's a, a change that takes place. Um, all right. Let's read uh, verses 27 through 31. And the Lord said to Aaron, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he went and met him on the mountain of God and kissed him. So Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord who had sent him and all the signs which he had commanded him. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. And Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses. Then he did the signs in the sight of the people. So the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel, and that he had looked on their affliction, then they bowed their heads and worshipped. I, um, I just had to think about what it was like as Moses made this journey. Because remember, he was in Midian, and now he's got to go back to Goshen. Uh, and so it's quite a trip. I just wonder what was going through his mind as he made this trip to go back to the people who uh, he had fled from. Uh, and the anxiety that would have built up. And then all of a sudden I started thinking about Aaron. Can you imagine Aaron when he receives this word, go out and meet Moses in the wilderness? And so you've got these two brothers that are walking towards each other to meet each other that have not seen each other in how long? How long has it been since they've seen each other? It's been at least 40 years because Moses has been on the backside of the desert for 40 years. But he was with uh, the Pharaoh much longer than that. And so a minimum of 40 years. Uh, and you know what builds up inside you whenever you go to see uh, some of your relatives. Specifically, if, they, if you were uh, kind of the, the, the child that got raised with all the blessings and you were in the palace and you were with the Pharaoh and the other one had been a slave all their life. I just wonder how they felt as they walked towards each other. Uh, coming with both of them coming with these different perceptions uh, and realities that ha had happened inside their life after all these years. Now look, and, and what did God tell uh, Moses and Aaron to do? Or what did he tell Moses to do? What did he tell him to do? Not to kiss him. What did you say, Ron? Go to the wilderness, but what was he supposed to do? Show them the signs that God had done. He told them specifically, show them the signs that God has done. Now, what, what were the signs that God had done? What do we see? Take the rod, throw it on the ground. What did it do? It turns into a snake. When it turns into a snake, you reach down, pick it back up, and it turns back into a rod, right? What was the other one? Stick your hand inside, inside your coat or your shirt, uh, pull it back out, and it come out as a leper hand. Uh, and then put it back in, come back out, and it's a, it's a healed hand. It's cured. Um, and the, the thing that God told Moses to share was this miracles that God had done that Moses had seen. Now, the, the rod, a couple of weeks ago, I said that rod represented to Moses the power of God. And you'll see us talk about this rod a lot more. And it's God's power and God's authority. The hand coming out nasty and dirty and then coming out clean represents a cleanness that happens. And it made me make this question that how many of us tell people the, the, the miracles that God has done in our lives. And I'm not talking about miracles of financial benefit or, or where God, you know, uh, lets you get home on a, a flat tire and no damage. I'm talking about specifically the, the miracle of salvation. 
where you once looked like this and God cleaned you and made you like this because that's exactly what he's illustrating with his hand when he puts it in hey this was nasty and now it comes back clean how many of us spend time telling people the miracle that God has done because that's at first God said make sure you show them the things I have done I think he wants us to do the same thing tell people the things God has done in our lives amen it's okay to say that um, And he went. Yeah, yeah. He, he just went. There was no argument there. He didn't. Um, I, I wonder what that reunion would have been like um, whenever they met. But notice what happens whenever Moses tells Aaron all of this stuff. And what did they do? Once, once they talked and had their kind of get together, what did them two do? They got all the elders together, and they, they showed them uh, everything that they had just talked about. And so you, now you have Moses and Aaron in front of this large group of people, and they're throwing a rod on the ground and picking it up, and he's talking about the burning bush, and he's showing them the hand, and all of that stuff. And, and notice the reaction of the people. How did the people react? Say that, what? They bowed down and worshipped. What caused them to bow down in worship? Look at what it says right there uh, in verse number 31. So the people, okay, they, the people believed, and when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel. When you hear that the Lord visited... I just, I had to underline that phrase right there and think about the times that the Lord has visited me. But yeah, and whenever I say that the Lord visited me, folks, it's, a, it's those moments in life whenever you're studying God's Word, His Word that just applied to your life and help you make decisions and gives you direction and you know that God has visited you. And whenever you do that, your reaction will be exactly the way theirs are. You will bow down in worship. You'll bow down in worship. Um, Bob, you'll remember this, uh, the time that's coming to mind with me. I had a huge decision. Um, I guess I'll just... So back whenever Candy and I had decided that we were going to leave Garfield... Uh, and all that had went on in this, uh, um, we'd spent four months really, really trying to figure this all out. And Bob, you and me and Shane and D Doug were at Arby's. And y'all were helping me and we were talking through it. And on, at that day, there was something that God did that said, Josh, you, you really need to leave. And I'll never forget stepping out of that building and this weight feel like it just lifted off of my back. It was just like, I, folks, I can't even describe it. It literally was just like this huge um, weight taken off. And then I was walking back to work, and I, it, I just fell into a spirit of worship because I felt like I was right where God wanted me to be. That's what the children of Israel, they had this weight that had been on them, and all of a sudden God visits them, and whenever that happens, the first thing they want to do is to worship. Um, folks, it is amazing whenever you, God visits you and you worship. Right in your time of need, something will happen. Uh, and that's what I see that happened right there. Um, any thoughts on that? Janet? Yeah, and, and think about how many years they had been in this affliction, had been going on. Um, 
all this time. And, and by the way, y'all know it. In fact, I thought we were going to get to it tonight, but it's only going to get worse on them for a period of time. Whenever, whenever, hey, whenever God starts to move, Satan's going to counter move, and we're going to see it happen. It always happens. When God moves, Satan will counter move. It will happen. When you want to get closer to the Lord, Satan's going to counter move, and he's going to try to put something in front of you, trying to stop you. You can't stop then. You got to keep going. Don't let it, don't let it get you down. Um, but you're exactly right. He, the, and he had looked on their afflictions. Pretty nice to know whenever God looks on your afflictions and, and says, hey, I'm coming to help. Amen? I really had planned on us getting through all of chapter 5. I don't, I don't think we're going to make it. Yeah. I, that's a great, great comparison that Candy just said. If you didn't hear what she said, let me, let me repeat it. She said, Bob had pointed out that Aaron got the news to go meet Moses. First thing, he just went, right? How did Moses respond whenever God was telling him to do something? Remember, there was this whole, all these excuses he made. Well, Aaron is visited by God when he has all this weight, this, you know, he's in slavery, all this pressure and all this stuff. In fact, this is giving him hope that he can go to. And so he was in one area of his life. Moses, in a pretty cushy job, got the family. Man, I'm going to inherit the farm when my, when my father-in-law goes, and everything is good. So the way he approached God talking to him was completely different. He came up with excuse after excuse after excuse. Aaron didn't. Aaron needed hope, and hope was given and he just got up and went where Moses argued. That's a great comparison between the two. Anyone else on this text? Brother Wayne. Mm-hmm. But the worship came when God Himself visited. Yeah, when they heard that the Lord had yeah. visited them. Yeah, and so I don't know. I just think there's kind of two levels there of response. Yeah, it it first was the belief, and and then the reality of God visiting, or now God visited. Yeah. Right? But yet, when Jesus visited them, you know, they didn't respond according to what he wanted them to respond. So, it's just interesting. I, I think it is interesting. I, I, uh, in fact, when you started saying that, I looked, and there is a semicolon there. I did see that. I had not noticed it before, but it does kind of a separation there between the two. Janet? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you put to the test when you're standing in front of somebody and you said, and you took this rod and watch. <laughs> And it turns to a snake. Aaron had to have. Uh, because he's up there being this spokesperson for the very first time in front of, you know, all these people. Um, and he just took it by faith and said, okay. Um, and, um, and I don't know in that verse number 28 if Moses showed Aaron the signs or if he just told him the signs. Um, but he, he might have seen that before, but you don't know or if it was just Moses telling him. I think it's, uh, uh, by the way, we're, we're just getting the story set up uh, to where we're going to see 
Pharaoh will actually, I mean, Moses and Aaron actually in chapter 5, early on, they're going to just walk right up to the Pharaoh uh, and, and start talking. So uh, it's about to get intense. Um, come back next week. They're about to get intense. <laughs> Thanks for laughing. <laughs> it was a good joke. Does anybody else have anything? God is good. And all the time. Amen, amen. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Father, Lord God, we come before your holy throne. Just thankful for this evening, this time that we can study your word. Father, um, we look on the life of Moses and we can see the ups and downs and the, the valleys, the good and the bad. But it's easy for us sometimes just to read these words. Um, but when we start thinking about all that is going on in the surrounding circumstances, to see the way that you move uh, on the lives of people. And Father, even to hear this, that uh, they believed um, by the words of what Moses and Aaron had spoken and the signs that they had seen. Father, let us, let us believe completely and totally in you, that we surrender our entire lives to you. Father, thankful for the ones that have come to the cross with repentance and that their hearts have been cleaned. That, Father, that, that we, we have been washed as white as snow. Your word teaches us that our sin is as far as the east is from the west. And when you look at us, you see the blood of your son, the ultimate sacrifice. Father, we're so thankful that so many years ago as we study this story that it all is directed to the cross and father i ask that you will allow us to to study this in depth to know what you have for us and we ask this in the name of our lord our savior jesus the christ amen amen